from D. James Kennedy Ministries. This is Kennedy Classics. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. God, from the very beginning, outlined in the panorama of the stars the whole message of the gospel of Christ. What better way to appreciate the night sky than with a stunning illustration of the stars and constellations, accompanied by biblical descriptions of how each one proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. D. James Kennedy Ministries presents, for the first time, the exclusive Gospel Planisphere. This one-of-a-kind planisphere folds out to poster size and shows how, contrary to pagan astrology, God placed the zodiac in the heavens to proclaim the story of redemption. Contact us today to receive the Gospel Planisphere, a fold-out guide to the gospel in the stars that can only be obtained through D. James Kennedy Ministries. Hello, I'm Frank Wright, president of D. James Kennedy Ministries, where we are standing for truth and defending your freedom. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Christmas is in the air all around us. What a wonderful time of year it is, as even the unbelieving world, knowingly or not, celebrates the birth of our Savior. We observe the tradition of giving gifts on Christmas because of the wise men who brought gifts to Jesus. They were led by a star in the sky to find him. And as that star pointed to Jesus 2,000 years ago, the psalmist tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Indeed, the constellations of stars in the sky tell the gospel story. When Dr. D. James Kennedy preached on this topic, it was perhaps his most compelling, most discussed, and certainly most requested series of sermons ever. Here is Dr. D. James Kennedy with the keystone message from that series, The Gospel in the Stars. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the 19th Psalm. We shall begin with the first verse and May we now give our careful attention to the inspired, the infallible word of the living God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. And may God speak to our hearts and minds today through his holy word, and may his name evermore be praised. Amen. Did you ever take an IQ test? If so, you probably came across some questions that are expressed in this way. A group of four things are set before you, three of them have something in common, and one of them seems out of place. Your task? To find that one that does not belong. We're going to give you a little IQ test right now. The first chapter of the Bible tells us that God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. And we're also told in that same first chapter this, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. 
Did you hear the four? Did one of them seem strangely out of place? Some of you are saying, what for? I'll go over it again. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, does one of those seem out of place? It should be obvious to everyone with a modicum of knowledge about astronomy that the heavenly bodies have a great deal to say about our years, about our days, and about our seasons. But how are they signs? What is a sign? A sign is something which proclaims a message. You put up a signboard, you do it to proclaim a message. Uh, what is the message that is proclaimed by the stars above? Well, that is the subject of our investigation this morning. I'm going to be talking to you about what might be called biblical astrology. Now that is certainly a rare connection of words. Biblical astrology, or perhaps the real meaning of the zodiac. Or perhaps we would call it, as I did, the gospel in the stars. And there exists in the writings of virtually all civilized nations a description of the major stars in the heavens above in something which might be called the constellations of the zodiac or the signs of the zodiac. And we have 12 signs in the zodiac. And if you go back to Rome or beyond that to Greece or before that to Egypt or to Persia or Assyria or Babylonia, regardless of how far back you go, there is a remarkable fact that all nations had the tw same 12 signs representing the same 12 things placed in the same order. Where did they come from? Well, let's go back as far as we can. And in the book of Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible, by the way, the book of Job goes back to approximately 2150 BC, 650 years before Moses came upon the scene to write the Pentateuch, over 1100 years before Homer wrote his Odyssey and Iliad, almost 1500 years before Thales, the first of the philosophers, was born, Job wrote this great book. And in this book, there, is, there are some remarkable things. You will recall that toward the end of the book in chapter 38 that God finally breaks in and speaks to Job and to his false comforters. And he says in that 38th chapter, as he is questioning Job, showing him and his companions their ignorance, he says to them that, uh, Canst thou loose the influences of the Pleiades? Of course, he cannot do that in verse 31. Canst thou bind rather the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Mazaroth in his season or guide Arcturus with his sons? And so we see here reference to the constellations of Orion and of the Pleiades and Arcturus. Also in the book of Job, there is reference to Cetus, the sea monster, and uh, also to Draco, or the great dragon. Now, the verse I would call your particular attention to is this one. Canst thou bring forth Mazaroth in his season? 
Now, that is a verse that I'm sure most all of you have read over and probably gone right on unless you've had a center reference Bible that has explained it to you. But if you have, you will discover that that Hebrew word Maseroth means the constellations of the zodiac. We're told that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day at earth speech and night unto night showeth language. There is no voice nor, lang nor speech where their language is not heard. Voice nor language where their speech is not heard. That God gave to all of the world a proclamation of the gospel in the stars. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. And God has indeed painted the sky and made it a picture gallery which is replete with the glories of his redemption. You may recall that the first message which God gave to man, the first preaching of the gospel, is found in the third chapter of Genesis immediately after the temptation and fall of man. God made that first pronouncement when he sa said to Satan, he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Let me clarify that, since this is the first gospel. It's called the Proto-Evangelium, the first evangel, or first preaching of the gospel. And it says that God is going to put enmity between the serpent Satan and the woman, and between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. That seed of the woman is Christ. Everywhere in the scripture, people are always talked about having come from a man. Only Christ is the seed of a woman. And it, that is the seed of the woman, will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. That Satan was going to bruise the heel of Christ, bringing about his death finally on the cross, but he would rise from that and Christ would utterly, totally, and eternally destroy Satan. This is the first gospel, and this is what the pictures in the sky are all about. Now, the distortion, the satanic counterfeit to this original proclamation of the gospel is indeed tragic. Satan is always the great liar, the great counterfeiter, the great deceiver. Whenever God has given people anything to proclaim the gospel, Satan has deceived them into trusting in the sign rather than the thing signified. For example, God created the church to proclaim the gospel. Millions of people trust in the church for their salvation. They want to find the right church which will save them. No church will save you. The church points to Jesus Christ, who is the only savior of men. Christ gave to us a great tangible symbol of his death upon the cross in the Lord's Supper, his broken body and shed blood, pointing to the once and for all atonement of the cross in which we should trust. But millions instead trust in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper as their hope of salvation rather than the thing which it signifies. They trust in the sign rather than that which is signified. And so also God proclaimed the gospel in the stars. And instead of trusting in the Christ to which they point so gloriously, they've trusted in the stars themselves. And that is what the modern corruption of astrology is, the idea that some mysterious and magical and supernatural powers emanate from the houses of the zodiac that affect and control our destiny and our lives. That is the lie of Satan, which will destroy every soul that believes it. Rather, what we have is a glorious sky painting of Jesus Christ as the Lord of glory. Well, in interpreting it, the question must be asked, where do we begin in interpreting this picture of the zodiac? A circle has neither beginning nor ending. Modern astrology begins with Aries, the ram or lamb. But how do we know that that is the place to begin? Since they have corrupted most everything else about it, perhaps that is corrupted too, and the fact is it has. I think that we may find the key to that riddle in the Sphinx. 
That may surprise some of you, but the Sphinx actually unlocks the mystery of the zodiac. The word Sphinx is taken from the Greek word sphungo, which means to bind closely together. And it is fascinating to note that in the temple of Esne near Karnak in Egypt, there is in the portico of the temple a great sky painting on the ceiling which shows the whole picture of the zodiac with all of its constellations. And between the figures of Virgo the Virgin and Leo the Lion, there is carved the figure of the Sphinx with the face or head of a woman and the body of a lion. And the woman's face is looking right at the Virgin, and the lion and the lion's tail is pointing right at Leo, telling us that we begin with the Virgin and we end with Leo. That, and that same Sphinx is found in the same place in a number of other of the great paintings of the Maseroth or the constellations of the Zodiac in other parts of the Near East, going back up to 4,000 years ago, telling us the original place of beginning. Let us then look briefly at a few of the, the pictures of the Zodiac. And for those of you that may never have looked at this matter at all, and fortunately, because of its, con of its corruptions and its satanic aspects, it's well that you have nothing to do with modern astrology whatsoever. But in order that you might appreciate what God has done, let me just tell you something about it, what it's like. If you paint the whole picture of the sky on the ceiling above, you would have a great circle, which is called the ecliptic, the ecliptic of the sun. Now, on the ecliptic, there are 12 major constellations known as the constellations of the zodiac or the signs of the zodiac. Zodiac is thought to mean the circle of animals, though better uh, linguists say that it comes from an ancient Hebrew word which means actually a path or step, that it actually is displaying the way that is the way of salvation. Let's begin then with Virgo. Virgo is a picture of a woman, and this woman is clearly identified as a virgin, even the name of the constellation, Virgo, the virgin, from Latin. Or if you go into Hebrew, it is Bethulah, which means a virgin. So the first thing we see is the emphasis upon the virginity of this woman. The second thing that we note is an emphasis upon her fertility or her woman motherhood because she holds in her right hand a branch and in her left hand some sheaths of corn or wheat seeds or barley seeds. Various interpretations given of that. And we see that, of course, it is the seed of the woman, that is, the virgin who will conceive and bring forth a child, as Isaiah tells us. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, that her seed will produce this. And furthermore, a branch. We read in Zechariah, For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. And in Zechariah 6.12, Behold the man whose name is the branch. And then in Isaiah 4.2, the branch of Jehovah shall blossom prosperously, that he is the servant, he is a man, he is God. He is the man, God's servant, Jesus, who has come. The second, and I'm not, I don't have time to deal with, but what a couple, with a couple of these, is, of course, the constellation or sign Libra, which means the scales. In Hebrew, it is mes, mesan naim, which means the scales weighing. And we are told, of course, in the Bible, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. And one of the scales is down and the other is up. And it's interesting that one of the stars in one of the scales is in Arabic, Zubin al Ganubi, which means the price which is deficient, showing the failure of man to be weighed properly in the scales of God, to be found lighter than vanity 
and therefore condemned. But the good news is the star, and the other one is Zubin al-Kimali, which means the price which covers, the superabundant one, referring, of course, to Christ. Thou art worthy, thou hast redeemed to God by thy blood, and Christ placed in the scales brings us up to God. And if this is not perfectly clear, then I would take you to the first of the minor constellations in the house of Libra, which is the constellation Crux, which is the Southern Cross. In Hebrew, it is called Edom, which means a cutting off. And Christ is that one who was cut off out of the land of the living for our sins. If we had the time, we could go around all of the signs of the zodiac and especially to examine all of the minor points of the three other constellations which tell the fabulous and fascinating story over and over again till finally we come to Leo the lion, a picture of Christ who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, finally coming again, not this time in humiliation, but coming in great power and glory, and his claws are right over Hydra, the serpent again, whom he's, he is about to finally and totally destroy. How glorious it is that whether we talk about the special revelation that God has given to us in the Word, or the general revelation which God has given to us in nature, the story is always the same, that the seed of the woman will destroy the seed of the serpent. I hope that as you go out on a given night and look up at the glories of the starry skies, that you will be more impressed than ever with the greatness and wonder of our God and the majesty of His grace and mercy. May we pray. How great thou art, O God, who hath painted the starry skies with a message of redemption, and hath revealed unto men everywhere the story of the coming and suffering and struggle and death and resurrection of thy Son. We thank Thee that we have it in all of its fullness in Thy Word today, and pray that we, having the full revelation, may join with Thee in making a world that is blind and deaf see and hear the wonders of Your grace. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. What an amazing message. The Gospel and the Stars. Have you experienced the gospel in your life, the wonders of God's grace? If you have, I urge you to share it with someone this week, perhaps even using some of what you've heard in today's unique message. If you are the one who has listened to this message in amazement, wondering if God's grace, His unmerited love and favor extends to you, I have great news. It does. You see, heaven is a free gift. It's not something we can earn or deserve because the Bible tells us that everyone has sinned and we've all fallen short of God's glory. But Christ paid for our sins with his death on the cross. Only he could do that because he's the only one who's ever lived a sinless life. Would you like to know that your sins are forgiven and that you can have abundant life? If so, then pray this prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. I repent of my sins and I ask for your forgiveness. I transfer my trust from all of my efforts to get to heaven to what you did for me on the cross. Thank you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, I want to welcome you to the family of God. We have a gift we'd like to send to you. It's a book written by Dr. Kennedy called Beginning Again. And that's exactly what you're doing. In these pages, you'll find the book of John from the New Testament and helpful tips on how to read and study God's Word. It's yours when you write to our address or call our toll-free number. Just ask for Beginning Again, and may God richly bless you. Today's message from Dr. Kennedy, The Gospel in the Stars, is part of his most requested series of sermons ever. 
Over the years, we have had countless people contact the ministry to try to obtain these messages, which unpack the true meaning of the zodiac signs in the constellations. Right now, we have a rare opportunity for you to receive this material. We have developed a truly stunning resource that you will want to get your hands on as soon as possible. It's the Gospel Planisphere, which shows the constellations of the heavens in vivid detail and explains how each of the zodiac signs, which were later perverted by pagan astrology, point to the gospel. It folds out to a poster size and is utterly unique. You simply cannot find anything like this elsewhere. We will send you the gospel planisphere as our thanks for your generous donation to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11164, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 888-332-3069, or go online to djkm.org. Some generous friends of this ministry have stepped forward to establish a generous Proclaim the Gospel Matching Challenge Fund to help us finish the year in the black. If you give right now, your impact will be essentially doubled as you match their challenge. So please, contact us right away to help us finish 2018 in the black, ready to move forward with gospel effectiveness in 2019. If you are able to give a generous donation of $50 or more, we will send you the beautiful gospel planisphere plus Dr. Kennedy's book, The Real Meaning of the Zodiac, which contains his research and writing on each of the zodiac signs and how they proclaim the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you can give a donation of $100 or more during this crucial year-end season, we will thank you by sending you the planisphere, the book, and the 13-message set of Dr. Kennedy's teaching on DVD or audio CD, The Gospel in the Stars, featuring a message on each sign of the zodiac. You simply do not want to miss out on this resource the most requested of Dr. Kennedy's entire ministry. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11164, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 888-332-3069, or you can go online to djkm.org. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Kennedy Classics. We'll see you next time. Today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.